Welcome to Evening Worship here at First Christian Church. We're glad you're here. As our God promises us uh, that He dwells with us, especially uh, as His people are gathered on the Lord's Day, we hope that you've come uh, anticipating meeting with our God, hearing Him speak through His Word, uh, and committing our worship uh, unto Him. Uh, there are a few announcements that I want to highlight. Again, a couple that's not in your bulletin is that our men's Bible study has started back on Tuesdays at 6 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Breakfast uh, is provided with uh, an abundance of coffee. And so we hope that you'll uh, come out and join us as we study uh, The Godly Man's Picture by the Puritan Thomas Watson. Um, it is not too late to come. We are moving uh, very slowly as we begin uh, this study, just a couple pages. So we're going to be in chapter 2 of that book. And if you're uh, in need of a book, we have some available in, in my office, and you can see me for a copy if you would like to, to grab one of those if you're not attending with us already. And then also not in your bulletin is uh, a Gideon speaker will be with us next Sunday during our morning worship service. Uh, we hope that you'll come as we hear a, an update from Gideon's International uh, and the work they're doing uh, not only here but around the globe. Uh, and also during our morning worship service, we'll have uh, communion. So we'll be partaking in the Lord's Supper together. And so we, we know it'll be a great day uh, to be in the house of the Lord. Um, Dylan Christian School news, that annual auction and barbecue is March the 30th. So at the end of this month, uh, we're encouraging all of our members to uh, support the ministry of Dylan Christian School by attending or sponsoring or buying tickets or whatever. Uh, with that night and so there's going to be silent auction items all day on the 30th there'll be a live auction that evening uh, also you can still buy barbecue tickets I believe um, from Fuller's Barbecue over in Pembroke uh, and so if you need any uh, help uh, navigating how you can uh, assist and support our ministry on that day you can call the the school office and then also I want to draw your attention to our Easter schedule or our Holy Week schedule. April 2nd, of course, is Palm Sunday. We'll have our regular schedule of services. And then April 5th, midweek services, we'll have our fellowship dinner at 5.30 as usual. Our, our children will have um, some Easter activities uh, during the evening, but uh, we will be, the adults will be meeting upstairs here in the sanctuary for the choral cantata that uh, the prelude will begin at 6 30 and so that'll be a full night of, of fellowship uh, together and then there's some other information there I want to highlight uh, our Good Friday communion service there'll be 6 p.m. here uh, in the sanctuary we uh, we have um, some guest accompanists coming in to assist in our worship and we're uh, especially looking forward uh, to that. And then Easter Sunday, we'll have our sunrise service here on the lawn, uh, weather permitting at 7. That'll be followed by a fellowship breakfast, then our Sunday school programs, and then, of course, morning worship uh, on Resurrection Sunday. There'll be no evening worship on April the 9th. And then the following week, spring's always a busy season here at our church, uh, the 16th through the 26th. So a Sunday, a Wednesday, a Sunday, and another Wednesday. Two Sundays and two Wednesdays, we'll have uh, different missionaries and ministries that we support, some representation from those ministries join us, joining us to share during uh, each service. And so we, we hope to have that schedule, that full schedule, uh, in your hands by uh, our next Lord's Day. But we'll have missionaries presenting during Sunday school and preaching uh, during uh, the Lord's Day. Both morning and evening worship services will be uh, Zooming, uh, having Zoom meetings with uh, Nathan Hilton, one of our missionaries over in Sunderland, England, uh, on Wednesday night. And then the following Wednesday, we'll be uh, having our Zoom meeting with Aaron Halbert in Honduras. Um, and so we are excited about uh, hearing all those updates and how the Lord is advancing his kingdom around the world. So, with all that in mind, uh, let us now uh, enter into uh, worship. Our God calls us to worship, of course, in His Word, and He invites us into His presence. And this is something we should not take lightly, that a holy God would invite us, uh, His children, uh, into His presence with singing, with prayers, with the Word. So let us commit ourselves unto Him and His worship as we hear from Psalm 95, selected verses from that psalm, please stand as you're able. 
as the psalmist says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into His presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to Him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. O come and let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for He is our God and we are His people, the sheep of His hand. As we uh, come into the presence of the Lord uh, in praise and in worship, let us take our hymn books in our hands and turn over to hymn 307, that very familiar hymn, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. Let's sing as we are able to do so. Father, we do gather together this evening, and Lord, we do come to you uh, through Christ, or through his blood, through his death, uh, that through which we've been forgiven, through which, uh, Lord, we can come to you and, and be declared righteous, through which we can come and, and not fear your wrath, for you have spent it all on Jesus on the cross for us. So, Lord, we do uh, come to you as children. We do come asking that you would be with us tonight. Uh, we do come confessing that we need you. Uh, Father, we pray that you would give us what we need. We pray for your grace to be uh, poured out upon us. We pray for your spirit to work in our hearts. 
We pray for you uh, to um, be with us, Lord, as we gather together to worship. And we ask this all in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, if you'd uh, turn in your hymnal again to Psalm uh, 40, or hymn number 40, which again is, I believe, hymn number 46. Um, again, it's the, the psalm in the Bible that inspired Martin Luther to write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. But just speaking about the fact that God is our, our refuge, both in terms of uh, here in this world where we know there's absolute uh, assurance that he will never fail, and of course, ultimately for our salvation uh, in going to Jesus Christ and trusting in his righteousness uh, for us. Uh, Miss Kim, if you wouldn't mind uh, playing through the song one time, and then we'll uh, sing it together. Well, before we uh, come to the singing of uh, selected hymns, let's first uh, come to our time of a corporate affirmation of faith. 
Uh, we have two questions printed in our bulletins from the Heidelberg Catechism, questions 65 and 67. And first we're going to see, uh, of course, as Protestants, we know that faith is what unites us with the Lord Jesus Christ, that it's by faith alone. Uh, but with the youth this morning in Sunday school, as we go through the book of Hebrews, we got to talk about the fact that faith, genuine saving faith, is a gift from God. Uh, that God begins this, this good work of renewing our hearts and opening our eyes to see the Lord Jesus Christ, and he will continue that work. And then secondly, we'll see this evening that the sacraments, uh, both word and sacrament, are given to us to point us uh, not to themselves, but to the Lord Jesus Christ and him alone and his righteousness in our place uh, at the right hand of the Father uh, accepted fully on our behalf. So again, I will read uh, the question and then together we will uh, read the answer back. It says, since then we are made partakers of Christ and all his benefits by faith only, whence does this faith proceed? From the Holy Ghost who works faith in our hearts by the preaching of the gospel and confirms it by the use of the sacraments. Are both word and sacraments then ordained and appointed for this end, that they may direct our faith to the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross as the only ground of our salvation? Yes, indeed, for the Holy Ghost teaches us in the gospel and assures us by the sacraments that the whole of our salvation depends upon that one sacrifice of Christ, which he offered for us on the cross. Amen. Well, let's uh, take this time. You can remain seated. Let's take this time to uh, have two hymns that uh, we choose. Uh, so we'll have a time now um, of two congregational selections for hymns to sing this evening. I'll go from anybody uh, that's ready to choose a hymn. 560, Mr. K. McGirt. 560 from up in the balcony. Uh, and we'll do all three verses. So 560, the Lord speak to me that I may speak. Um, and again, let's do all three verses of this uh, hymn.
642. And that was a quick one, so I think we can uh, do this entire uh, hymn. Be Thou My Vision, 642. And we'll do uh, all five verses. Let's return to uh, our God in prayer uh, again together. Father in heaven, you are indeed worthy of our adoration and our praise. You alone uh, are worthy of the, of the praises of your people. And in fact, you are so worthy of praise and adoration that you tell us that if we will not cry out, uh, the rocks will cry out in our place. And yet here we are committed to sing praises to your name, to offer back thanksgivings for your good gifts that you have given to us from on high. Let there never be a day that the rocks cry out in our place, for let praise and adoration and thanksgiving continually be on our lips. As the psalmist even called us into worship, let us sing to the Lord, let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise we pray that our praises have been pleasing to your ear as your people called by your name forgiven justified and being sanctified by the power of the cross of calvary and by the power of your spirit we pray O oh lord that the adoration that we have shown here will continually be a part of our daily living. Father, we do come knowing that we come with praise and adoration for we are a people who are unworthy uh, to be in your presence as you have called us into your presence, especially here on the Lord's Day, as you have called us sons and daughters of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We are those who will confess that we 
do not deserve this gift of salvation. We do not deserve your favor and your mercy. And, and yet you have shown us your love and your long suffering ness and your kindness uh, to us through this unmerited favor from heaven. You have called us and you have chosen us before the foundations of the world. You have changed our hearts, replacing our heart of stone with heart of flesh so that we might pursue after thee. And you have called us your beloved. You have called us saints, set apart ones who are now, even now, clothed in the righteousness of Christ so that when you see us, you see not our sins, not our iniquities, not our failings, but you see the perfect obedience of your Son, Jesus, and you proclaim us not guilty. Father, we know that we have struck out against your commandments. We know that we have erred in our ways. We know that we have fallen short of your glorious standards, and yet we come, yet we come knowing that we are only worthy through Jesus Christ. And we are worthy to enter into the throne room of grace and mercy and intercession for our brothers and sisters in our church, for our beloved friends and our close family members as we pray for the sick. We know that there are many uh, in our midst who are dealing with sickness and pain. We know that there are many uh, that we love and adore who are dealing with mental anguish and frustration, depression and anxieties. And we pray, O oh Lord, that in these seasons of doubt, in these seasons of pain, in these seasons of sickness, that you would show yourself to be uh, their powerful God, that you would work through the prayers of your people and that you would heal their bodies. And in fact, Father, we give you thanksgiving for the common graces of things like good doctors and nurses and medicine so that we might be relieved from our symptoms and our ailments. But let us also remember that if you do not heal us from our daily pains and our aches, if you do not take away the thorns in our flesh, if you do not cure our mental anxieties and anguishes, Father, they are all being used to humble us in your presence, to, to draw our attention up to heaven where all of these things will be no more. We pray that even as we deal with sicknesses and pains within our own body, that it would make us long even more for the eternal home of heaven. Well, there will be no more sickness, no more pain, no more tears, uh, no more depression or anxieties or frustration or anger, but we will gather around the throne forever in heaven in perfect bliss and in perfect adoration. There we will feast with you. We will drink to our fill. We will be invited to that marriage supper of the Lamb and we will behold you and we will be close to you and we will be holy as you are holy. And so, Father, we think about even that holiness that we will experience in heaven and we pray for the sanctification of the saints here. We pray that by the preaching of your word, by the power of your spirit, that you would enable us to put to death sin in our life. As we heard this morning, that we would not be a people who partially repent for the sins that uh, we, we know, but that we would even uh, repent of those sins that we have forgotten about. That we would be a people who are quick to, to plead the mercies of Christ over our shortcomings, our sins of omission and commission. Uh, we pray, O oh Lord, that we would uh, follow after Thee, that we would pick up our cross daily and pursue Christ and Christ's likeness, and that, we would, and that we would proclaim, as we even sung about just a few moments ago, that You would use our time in Your Word, that You would use our sanctification so that we might share uh, the good news of the Gospel for all people, to our family, our family members, our classmates, our neighbors, our community. Father, we do pray for our church and her ministries. We pray for continued success, uh, gospel success. We pray, Lord, that you would grow us, that you would fill our sanctuary, that you would uh, set us on fire with the Holy Spirit so that revival may, uh, may spark, may be kindled even here. We pray that we would be strong in the face of the evil one and strong in the face of temptation, that we would be a, a light upon the hill, a, a city 
uh, who, who proclaims, a people who proclaims uh, the hope of Jesus Christ. Uh, and we pray, O oh Lord, that we would uh, be those who are committed to the ordinary means of grace, that we understand that it's by your word and by your sacraments and by our prayers that you are uh, indeed doing a good work here uh, amongst us. We do pray for the civil authorities within our community, uh, in our state, uh, in our nation. We pray from uh, Capitol Hill to our local councils that you would uh, fill those governing bodies with Christian men and women. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would uh, reveal to us and encourage us in our active role of being citizens here uh, in Dillon, in South Carolina, and in, uh, in America. We pray that we would uh, elect Christian men and women who seek to glorify your name. We pray that we would be a people who come to your throne uh, asking you uh, to save the politicians that we have. Surely we can say through election would you fill uh, our, our nation, uh, our national leaders uh, with the Holy Spirit, whether it be the salvation of their souls or whether it be the election of uh, that's executed every year or every four years, uh, Father. We pray uh, that we would be diligent in our uh, carrying the, the Word of God to the very ends of the earth. And even as we think about uh, across our borders here in America, we pray for the Christian mission worldwide. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grow your kingdom from around the globe, that you would draw men, women, and children unto yourself from all tribes, nations, and tongues, so that we might have a foretaste of heaven uh, that is to come, where all peoples uh, will gather around your throne uh, to worship and adore you, the, the Lamb who was slain uh, with worthy, uh, worthiness and honor uh, that you uh, rightfully deserve, for you are the one who has uh, saved our souls. Father, we do pray for illumination by your word. We know that as we come to it, we cannot rightly understand it unless you give understanding. Uh, and so, Father, we pray that you would uh, give us ears to hear this, your word, as we turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And would it change us, conform us, encourage us, convict us, uh, all for the sake of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, again, uh, if you will, uh, turn in your Bibles to... Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, you see in our bulletin that we are focusing really on verse 13, a singular verse this evening as we think about uh, the preached word there in uh, the churches of Thessalonica. Uh, as Paul has already established, he has been a, a gentle mother uh, to the Thessalonian believers. He has cared for them, he has sacrificed for them. Uh, he has loved them, uh, not on an impersonal level, but a, on a very personal, uh, relational level. Uh, that he has lived among them, he has preached the gospel to them, he has cared for them. Even so much so that he has done it here in Thessalonica, what is implied here in our verses that we handled last week, for free. Uh, he, has, he has recognized that there is a responsibility from him and the apostles not to put a financial burden uh, upon the believers, the church of Thessalonica. Uh, they are young infants in their church growth process. And so he says, I have labored all night making tents so that I might labor all day and preaching the gospel so that I would not be a burden to you. And of course, last week we began looking at <clears throat> what a, a, uh, a God-pleasing ministry uh, would look like. Uh, and even we referenced a, a analogy of sorts uh, there in verse uh, 11 and 12 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 where he says, Like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. What would that be in our context? And admittedly, we will spend some time in 11 and 12 uh, yet again. Let us read our text for the evening, verse 13. People of God, hear the word of God, for it's written for you and to you. And we also thank God constantly 
or maybe your translation says, without ceasing, for this, that when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for it. Well, as I think about what Paul has committed himself to uh, here in Thessalonica, as he has done ministry amongst these believers in this uh, hub of a city, I think about the major difference between a lecturer and a pastor. Maybe we would be better to say a lecturer and a shepherd. A number of years ago, uh, the session and I uh, read together a book by Dr. Timothy Whitmer called The Shepherding Leader, or The Shepherd Leader. And, and throughout all of that book, it really established a shepherding model for the local ministry where we would understand that it is our duty as elders of the church to not only know the sheep in which we are shepherding, but also feed the sheep the word of God. You see, it's here that I think that Paul is establishing a very important part of the gospel ministry here amongst the believers in Thessalonica. I am not here to give academic lectures about the things of faith. I am here to preach. In fact, I think he would say that I am here to feed the sheep. Now, it's, not, uh, it's probably not new news to you, uh, but while me and Pastor Don were in seminary uh, studying for our Master of Divinity degrees, we had to take a number of preaching or hermeneutics classes. Admittedly, uh, Erskine, where I went to seminary, didn't have the preaching labs that uh, RTS, where Pastor Don went. Uh, but nonetheless, we had to preach... Uh, sample sermons before our classmates. We had to read a number of preaching books and we had to see how uh, delivery and personalities and styles all differed even amongst our uh, classmates and even amongst our professors. I was glancing even at my um, bookshelves in my office uh, this afternoon as I was uh, reviewing my notes for this evening's sermon and I began to wonder, how many books on preaching do I have here in my office? And just books on preaching, not pastoral ministry that have, has chapters on preaching or multiple chapters on preaching, but just preaching. How many books do I have in my office? And it was over 20. And I thought about all the different styles that these authors preached with. I've heard pretty much every one of them. Uh, the different personalities that they preached with. The different ways that they, you know, styled or, or mapped out or organized, outlined their sermons. All these things were different. And yet, as I began to thumb through some of these 20 books, I realized something that was the same. That there was an utmost reverence to the preaching ministry of the church. You know, the Puritans, our Puritan brothers, those who have gone before us, used to call the, the pulpit the sacred desk. And I always wondered about that. Why did they call it the sacred desk? Because they did not believe in sacred spaces. If you don't know what that means, they did not think that there was anything really, really spectacular about a sanctuary. They would even not use the language of a sanctuary. They would just say it's the worship hall or the meeting hall but they would use the sacred desk as the name for the pulpit. Why did they do such a thing? And it was exactly what Paul writes here in verse 13. Because the Puritans and all these authors that I began to thumb through this afternoon, they considered the Bible preached not to be mere words of man, as you see there in verse 13, but as what it really is, the word of of God. You see, there's something, something very spectacular, even uh, I would say something supernatural happening here when we sit under the preaching of the Word. While your pastor is a fallible man, uh, a sinful man, 
Uh, Pastor Don would fit into those ranks as well. Uh, when we preach the Word of God, we are preaching a Word that is inerrant, infallible, full of authority. It's full of application and full of reproof or rebuking. It's full of exhortations. It's full of comforts. It's full of charges. And, and in fact, you notice that those three last adjectives is exactly how Paul outlines his method for preaching the Word in verses 11 and 12. If you'll let your eyes glance back to even our text that we handled last week, it really starts there in verse 12. We exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God. Now you have to understand something about the way Paul is writing. He is writing these three words or these three phrases. They're actually phrases in the original Greek so that you might understand the role of preaching uh, in the life of the believer, in the life of the church, in the life of Christian experience, we might say. He says first that we have exhorted each one of you. This word exhorted means something like we have called or urged or we have pleaded with you. We have encouraged you to action that you might walk in a way that is worthy of God, the same God who has called you into His own kingdom and glory. You know, it's here that as he begins to talk about this exhortation, this call, this urging, this pleading, what are we calling believers to? What are we calling believers to in our preaching? Well, we're calling believers to faith. And you say, well, Matt, they're already believers. Why are we calling them to faith? And you remember the, the scene as, as Jesus leaves the Mount of Transfiguration, as he comes down with Peter, James, and John, he finds the rest of the apostles there, and they're trying to cast out this demon. And he begins to say something along the lines of, well, this kind cannot be cast out with anything but prayer. And the Father falls before Jesus and he says, I believe, but help my unbelief. You see, it is the believer's life that needs more faith. Well, of course, we're calling unbelievers to faith. We're calling sinners to faith. It's the idea that the offer of the gospel is free and for all. And yet we're calling believers at the same time to more faith. To have a deeper trust in the Word of God, to have a deeper trust in the person and work of Christ, to have a deeper trust uh, in the Gospel and the promises of the Gospel. We go through seasons of, of doubt. We go through seasons of frustration. We go through seasons of spiritual anxiety. And we need reminders that our Lord is faithful. It's exactly what the Apostle says, isn't it? That He is Faithful even in the times that we are faithless. That faithlessness that the Apostle talks about is written to believers. And, and that, that whole point of the Gospel that He is faithful even when we are faithless is a call to more and more faith. So we're calling sinners to faith by the free offer of the Gospel that Jesus Christ will save all who call upon His name for salvation. He'll save everyone who comes to Him in faith and repentance. And at the same time, Paul says that we're calling believers to even deeper faith. We're exhorting them, we're urging them, we're pleading with them for faith and for holy living. That's exactly what he says there at the end of verse 12. We're exhorting you to walk in a manner worthy of God. And it demands that we re-ask the question that we approached even last week in verses 1 through 6. It's as if the Apostle Paul is asking us, why are we a Christian? Are we a Christian so that we might receive a, a license to live in our sinfulness, our sinful identities, our sinful patterns? Are we Christians to live for God's glory. Paul says very clearly here that we are exhorting each one of you so that you might work or walk in a way that is pleasing to God in a manner 
worthy of Him. But you also notice there that He uses another phrase, another word. Not only did they exhort, but they also encouraged. I actually think that a better translation, and maybe your translation or your version of God's Word has this, and comforted you comforted you. It's this idea that Paul says that the Word of God not only gives you a call, an urging, an exhortation to follow Christ, but that it also at the same time encourages you to walk with Christ or comforts you in your walk with Christ. If we were to do some scratching at the original language here, the Greek, because it's in the New Testament, it's as if Uh, Paul is using that same language that Jesus uses in John chapter 14 when he's promising the Holy Spirit. He says, it's better for me to, to go so that the Comforter, talking about the Spirit, might come. He says that the Word of God comforts us. It speaks to us in a, in a friendly manner. It rouses us and shows us what ought to be done. It strengthens us, us for, for action. And so, it, so Paul's saying that the Word of God comes alongside of us to assure us of our salvation. Assure us of our salvation. You, you might understand where I'm trying to go with that. If we're to be exhorted to have more faith, if we are to be exhorted in preaching to live holy lives, that means that there are times, there are seasons in which we are not living uh, for the glory of Christ. You know, there are times where we have besetting sins, ongoing sins that we cannot shake. There are times that we, uh, we stray far from the Lord. There are times in our spiritual doubting that we feel as if God is not near. The Word comes alongside of us and it comforts us. It encourages us. It, it's a friendly reminder, if you will, that our salvation is, is sure in Christ because He is the sure foundation of our justification and our future glorification. Again, it's what the Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 2 where we will see Christ on that day, on that last day, and on that day we will be like Him. It's what Paul writes in Philippians, that the good work that he's started in us, he will bring to its completion. And so not only is there a call to more faith, is there a call to more obedience, but there's also this same idea that it assures us that even when we feel away from Christ, He is close. And He is there. And by His Word, He is not silent. But look at that third word, charged. We charged. It's this, uh, this idea that uh, it, there's an emphatic, if you will, an emphatic affirmation, a, a, a serious declaration, an assertion that we must be born again. We must live worthy of Christ. It's this idea that not only will the Word of God encourage us, but it will also convict us. That it will show us the holiness and the justice of God towards sinners, and it will show us the error of our ways. It will rebuke us where we need rebuking, and it will step on our toes exactly where it needs to step on our toes. Oftentimes, in growing up in the Pentecostal church, I remember hearing multiple people as they walked out of the sanctuary, uh, they would say something along the lines of, Pastor, I should have worn my steel-toed boots today because you really preached all over my toes. Well, it wasn't the preacher preaching all over your toes. It was the Holy Spirit convicting you of sin. But nonetheless, we understand what that feels like. We hear a sermon. We hear the word preached. And there's times that it begins to convict us, show us our errors, show us our sinfulness, and at the same time show us the holiness of God. And so Paul says that they've committed themselves to this sort of method, this sort of teaching. It's full of exhortation, it's full of 
comfort. It's full of encouragement, but it's also full of conviction, rebuke, reproof, a charging to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into His own kingdom and glory. But remember the analogy that he starts it with. It's like a father with his children. And so all the fathers in here ought to pay attention. Is this the kind of household? Is this the kind of way that we're leading family worship or we're feeding our children? Just as the analogy says, a father has the right. Better yet, the the father has the role. The God-commanded role to exhort, to comfort, to encourage, to charge His children there in His household. He's saying that same authority, that same role in which fathers do it in their household, we do it here within the local church, and we will answer for the way that we teach and lead. We know from texts like Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Ephesians chapter 5 and Hebrews chapter 12 that that where God has given the role of authority to elders within the church and fathers within the home, that they will answer for the way that they disciple their children. That they'll answer for the ways that they lead the congregation. And so here it is that, that, that the manner of teaching, you might say, has been like a father does with his own children. They stand, they execute their calling Because God has given them the authority and the role to do so. And there's something that needs to be mentioned here in this fatherly kind of role. This analogy of the father in the household. Notice who he says the recipients of his preaching are. We exhorted, read those next four words, each one of you. It reminds me of that Uh, that text that the Apostle Paul writes, there's no Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female within the household of God, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. And so so as Paul is preaching, he's not just preaching to the spiritually smart or gifted. He's not preaching just to men. He's not preaching just to adults. He's preaching to the household of God. And a very practical outworking of this is Presbyterians believing that the children belong to the covenant of God. We believe that children have a role within the the preaching ministry of the church. That even as my children, five and three and five months, sit under the preaching of the word, we know that they might not understand each and every phrase or each and every turn of a word, and yet we know that the Spirit is at work. And the Spirit is applying these truths into their hearts, and, and the Spirit is, is allowing even a youngster's, a youngster's mind to turn so that they might grow up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You see, as Paul writes this letter to the Thessalonian church, he, he has written it with the idea with the expectation that it would be read within a a worship service of the local church on the Lord's Day. And so all the men and all the women and all the children would be sitting in a sanctuary, a meeting place, much like this. And Paul's letter would begin to be read unto them. And so he says, just like I have preached to each and every one of you, There is a way that we are to walk worthy of the Lord's calling as a five-year-old or a 50-year-old. As a male or as a female, as a boss at work or just a, a a subordinate employee. The gospel preached impacts the way that we live no matter what role and in what place we might be. As a father does his own children, he has exhorted, he has comforted, he has charged these Thessalonian believers. And they have shown fruit. You notice there in verse 13, as he says that they have received the word of God, not as mere words of men, but as what it really is, the word of God. He says, it is at work within you believers. 
Now you think about Paul here being the spiritual father, being a spiritual father of these believers at Thessalonica. You can imagine that he has kind of the same response as the Apostle John in 3 John verse 4. He says, there is no greater joy than to see my children walking in the truth. And there's a big difference, isn't there, from what the Apostle John is saying and even what the Apostle Paul is saying. It's not that they just know the truth. It's that they live out the truth. We understand, don't we, that the right hearing of God's Word being preached is obedience. You know, I've used that illustration before uh, of, of a baseball game, and you see those coaches on third base and on first base, and they're doing all those funny hand motions. They're swiping down their arm. They're tapping their head twice. They're wiggling their nose. They're scratching their eyebrows. It's all a, it's all a sign, isn't it, for the base runners or the pitcher or the catcher or the batter, all of these things are happening in the, in the ball game. And you, as, as the viewer, you have no clue what's going on. You can see those coaches doing all those funny hand motions, and yet you don't know that they've got the hand motions right until it's executed, right? And that's exactly what the Word of God is to do for each and every one of us. It is to be heard and understood and then executed it's written in such a way and it's preached in such a way that Paul says that we do not know that you're rightly hearing the Word of God until you walk in a manner worthy of His name. And so he's saying, it has done my heart much good to see you as my spiritual children walking in the truth. Not merely knowing it, not just getting the answers right on a theology exam, but you are living a life that's reflective of Jesus. You know, as, as, a, as a father, you know, it's often been my prayer, in fact, it's every day my prayer, that my kids would have that boring testimony, right? That they would never remember a day that they did not know who Jesus was, did not know their need for Him and His salvation. And I pray constantly, Lord, let us see fruit in their lives, even as a five-year-old, even as a three-year-old. Let me see fruit in their lives that they know the gospel, and they live out the gospel. You know, of course, as a five-year-old can, but let them show forth Christ. Let me know that they are getting what daddy and mommy are, 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 are teaching them, are proclaiming to them. And you would, and you would say, hey, you know, maybe on the wedding day, it does my heart much good to see my daughter, or see my son striking out to start a new family, and they have walked in a way that is worthy of the Lord. That's where Paul is. He's a proud papa, it seems. You've accepted the Word of God for what it really is, and not only have you heard it, but we can see that you know that the Word of God is in fact the Word of God because it is at work in you believers. God has called you into His own kingdom and His own glory, and you have responded faithfully. You have rightly heard the word of truth because you are living out the word of truth. Now think about the opposite of that. The grief. The grief that Paul would feel if they were not living out the gospel, if they were not living out the truth. If there's no greater joy in your heart, to see your children walking in the faith, think about there would be no greater grief than that seeing your child departing from the truth. Even now, as, as we discipline Brooks and, and Anna Kate, it's so often said in our home, Brooks, you know better. Anna Kate, you know better. And in fact, the same thing could be said for those who have hardened their heart away from or against the preaching of the Word. You know, so often we are reminded that there are two responses to the Word preached. Either you can hear it, accept it, believe it, and obey it, or you can harden your heart and say, I don't need it. I don't need Christ and His salvation. I don't need Him teaching me how to live. I'm going to do life on my own terms 
Oh, I'm going to do life my own way. I'm going to be my own God. Either the gospel preached softens, continues to soften your heart, or the gospel preached continues to harden your heart. And on that day of judgment, when we stand before the throne of our great God and King, for those who have sit or sat under the preaching of the Word, it's as if the Father of Heaven will look at you and say, you knew better. Where much is received, much is expected. You knew better. I think that's exactly what Jesus is getting to when He says that there will be some who stand before the throne of judgment and say, Lord, Lord, haven't we said that we believed in Your name and haven't we done great works for the kingdom? And He will still say, depart from Me, for I never knew You. You knew better. May we never hear those words from the Father in heaven, that we knew better. May we never be those who grieve His heart by not obeying, but may we be those who, like in Thessalonica, would say that we have received the Word of God. We have received it not as mere words of men, but for what it really was, the words of God, and may it always be at work in our hearts and in our lives for the advancement of His kingdom and the glory of His name. In the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, we pray. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we do thank You for this, Your Word, and we pray, O oh Lord, that it would convict us where it needs to convict us and encourage us where it needs to encourage us. That it would comfort us and yet at the same time rebuke us if that is what's needed so that we might execute our calling to live worthy of Christ's name whether that be at work or at home, at church, in our community, may we live out the transforming grace of God. May we not just know about you with the head, but may we always say that the gospel of God has changed our hearts, changed our lives, and has, and has, has caused us to pursue Christ uh, in our daily ways. Father, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Well, of course, we'll uh, sing uh, this verse of Psalm 117 to the tune of all creatures of our God and King as we now receive the benediction. Please stand and receive the blessings of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face to shine upon you, be gracious to you, and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.